by this time next week, we'll know if Kate Forbes... I want to reach across the divide and persuade no voters to vote yes in a future referendum. Ash Regan. I am the only candidate with a published plan on legally achieving independence. Or Hamza Youssef. I'll build a team that will deliver independence. I'll protect our pro-independence majority. Will be the one to succeed the formidable Nicola Sturgeon as the next leader of the Scottish Nationalist Party and also as the new First Minister of Scotland. It is incumbent on all three of the candidates to address the concerns that the people of Scotland have about the day-to-day -day issues that they're dealing with. That's how we retain the trust of the people of Scotland. But will they be able to retain the trust of Scottish voters? What would each candidate mean for Scottish independence and for the SNP's chances at the next election? particularly given how acrimonious the leadership debates in the last few weeks have become. Now, rather than confronting the NHS crisis, we have an SNP talking to themselves about themselves. In fact, it seems the only things missing from this SNP leadership election is an Ash Regan press conference outside the Four Seasons. And while the leadership candidates battle it out, is the party machinery imploding after three high-profile resignations in the last few days, including Nicola Sturgeon's husband's. The ultimate irony that one of the first casualties created by her resignation is the man standing next to her, who is her husband, Peter Murrell, the chief executive of the SNP. As all three candidates prepare to go head-to-head -head in a leadership debate hosted by Times Radio tonight, we're bringing you a guide to the campaign so far. You're listening to Stories of Our Times from The Times and The Sunday Times. I'm Manveen Rana. Today, the race to replace Nicola Sturgeon. My name's Kieran Andrews and I'm the Scottish political editor of The Times and Sunday Times. Kieran, the last time we spoke, just four weeks ago, it was just after Nicola Sturgeon had resigned and you know, the timing had come as a bit of a shock to everyone, really. Just remind us very briefly of what were the big issues that probably led to her resignation? Well, there were two main things. The first was around the strategy for a second independence referendum. Nicola Sturgeon had wanted to use the next general election as a de facto referendum, as she put it, whereby more than 50% of the votes being cast for the SNP or other pro-independence parties would be taken as a mandate for Scotland to begin exit negotiations from the UK. This plan was met with quite a lot of pushback from within the party and there was a special conference that was supposed to have taken place at the weekend just past there on the 19th of March to decide on that strategy. And there was a lot of chat that Nicola Sturgeon might have lost that conference vote and put herself in a real bit of bother. There were also domestic policy issues, but the other thing hanging over Nicola Sturgeon and the SNP is an investigation by Police Scotland into the use of um, around £600,000 that was raised to specifically campaign for independence. We don't know the outcome of that investigation. It's still ongoing, but it was quite high up the news agenda as Nicola Sturgeon resigned. And at the centre mm -hmm. of that investigation, in some form, is Peter Murrell, her husband and the chief executive of the SNP. So... Amid all that chaos, Nicola Sturgeon steps down and immediately a leadership contest begins. These three candidates have emerged. Let's start with Hamza Youssef. Just tell us, what do we need to know about him? I want to build on that winning formula that has seen us win election after election. That radical, that progressive agenda, which has seen success for the SNP, grow to unprecedented heights. The first and most important thing you need to know about Hamza Youssef is he is absolutely the establishment candidate. He has the 
tacit endorsement of Nicola Sturgeon, although she has said that she will not publicly endorse anyone. Her deputy first minister has endorsed Hamza Youssef, as have most of the cabinet and many senior ministers. He's 37, so relatively young in political terms. He's the health secretary, so is overseeing a pretty tricky position in Scotland at the moment. Before that, he was the justice secretary and has been transport minister. He's being called Hamza useless. Is that a term that's sticking? It's a term that's been used by his opponents for quite a time. Every part of Scotland's NHS is in crisis because of Hamza Youssef. So can the First Minister tell us, is this useless health secretary really the best the SNP have to offer? But Kate Forbes, the finance secretary, the other candidate, picked up this theme and ran with it during a pretty bruising televised debate on STV. Kate Forbes, you can go first. Thanks very much. Well, Hamza, you've had a number of jobs in government. When you were transport minister, the trains were never on time. When you were justice minister, the police were strained to breaking point. And now as health minister, we've got record high waiting times. What makes you think you can do a better job as first minister? Now that has been taken by the opposition parties as an endorsement of their previous criticisms of Hamza Youssef and has been rolled out at every opportunity. Hamza Youssef would argue that he has run some pretty tough departments. A public service uh, delivery job uh, no. in government. I've had, I've had, three, I've had transport, job. justice and the health secretary, probably the three toughest jobs in government. And what I would say to you about continuity... You mentioned there Kate Forbes. Tell us a bit about her. What do we need to know about her? Kate Forbes is the finance secretary. She was promoted into post unexpectedly on the eve of the 2020 budget when Derek Mackay, who was finance secretary and was the the favourite to take over from Nicola Sturgeon with the idea that that was some succession planning there, Derek Mackay was found to have been sending text messages to a 16-year-old schoolboy and he resigned the night before the budget And I call on Kate Forbes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today I present the Scottish Budget for 2020. Kate Forbes stepped in, delivered it, and then was promoted into the post. She's 32, again, very young in political terms, and has been seen for a while as a potential rising star of the party. Her campaign got off to a really terrible start, though, when she was asked questions about her views on same-sex marriage. Marriage being between a man and a woman, that is what I practice. But I will not roll back on any rights that already exist in Scotland. If you were about at the time where you were able to legislate on this, that's been and gone now, but you would have voted against that then because of your beliefs. I would have. That saw her lose supporters, including a few ministers, not just because of her expressing that view, but also because there's a a view among some of those former supporters that answering the question the way she did showed a lack of competence and a lack of political judgment. That's really interesting. So there are two things going on there. There's the people who think she's too green, she's too young and inexperienced to know how to handle difficult questions in interviews. And then there's those who worry about what she's actually saying. You know, people have talked a lot about her religious beliefs and how they would influence her policy. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, Kate Forbes is a member of the Free Church of Scotland, which is an an evangelical church in the kind of Protestant faith. It teaches a lot of socially conservative values, which has led to Kate Forbes being asked many questions around this, not just about same-sex marriage, but about abortion. Um, Do you personally believe that a woman who's been raped should be able to get an abortion? I have already said that I wouldn't have an abortion myself, but I would uphold the laws which allow for women to access uh, abortion services. But do you personally believe that a woman who's been raped... I've already said that I personally wouldn't have an abortion. And around conversion therapy and children being born outside of wedlock... Every time she is asked, she has answered very fully and very honestly. And in some quarters, that could be seen as a positive. However, she would have wanted her campaign to be focused on the economy and and policies around that. 
Mary Black, the deputy leader of the SNP at Westminster, who is gay, has said that Kate Forbes' comments were very hurtful to her and has suggested that the SNP may split if Kate Forbes becomes the party leader. And at one point, when she'd just done one of these interviews, I know it was reported, and we wouldn't normally use language like this, but it is a direct quote, that a senior member of her campaign said, she has fucked it. Yeah, somebody had texted that that to me, and I'm aware that it went to at least one other journalist as well. So, yeah, there there was a big degree of anger. People who would have ordinarily been more involved and rallying the troops and lobbying on her behalf haven't felt that they're able to do so. So I'm just going to wait for that siren to go. (sighs) Yeah, that was just the ambulance going past for Kate's campaign. (laughs) It's all going so well. And just, Kieran, explain to us, because I think a lot of people will be surprised. Here you've got one of the leading candidates for the race. She's supposed to be a rising star, Why do you think she was so unprepared for questions about her faith? Well, the interesting thing was, and I I did one of those interviews at the very start, and she was looking down at notes. So it is not that Kate Forbes was unprepared. This was Kate Forbes not gaming out how her comments would be received by her colleagues and by a a number of people in, in the wider public. So there you've got the two main candidates at the moment. You've got the lines being drawn across the party. And then a third candidate emerges. Tell us a bit about her. Yeah, this is Ash Regan, who is the former community safety minister. She resigned from the Scottish government over the gender recognition reform bill, which um, would allow trans people to self-identify and um, lower the age at which people could transition to, to 16. Now, you said you resigned over trans rights. No, I resigned over the conflict with women's rights. Yes, over, over the, the gender recognition reform. Ash Regan raised serious concerns about that and resigned before the votes took place on that bill at Holyrood. She is very much the outsider candidate. She concedes that herself. But she's seen as being the candidate that brings along maybe the more hardline wing of the SNP who want independence yesterday and who believe that the current Scottish government has spent too much time focusing on the wrong issues, as it were, as they see it, things that they don't think are are important to the general population, like, for example, the, the gender reforms. So she definitely speaks to a constituency in the party, but again, is very much the outsider on that front. In a way, that, that, those are also the beliefs of Alex Salmond. Is she effectively the, the Alex Salmond candidate in this race? That allegation has been made. It has been rejected by Ash Reagan. But there are striking similarities in some of the policies, even down to things like just a few days after Alex Salmond suggested that the Stone of Destiny should not be sent from Scotland down for the king's coronation. You know, the stone of destiny is the king is supposed to sit above that when he is um, crowned. Ash Regan suddenly had a very similar idea. She also has brought in as one of her most senior advisors a guy called Kurt Torrance, who was heavily involved in uh, the SNP becoming a real online force, but then who left the party and stood as a candidate for Alex Simmons' Alpa party. Good evening from Glasgow. Hamza Youssef, Kate Forbes and Ash Regan. They are going head to head for the first time on TV. And Kieran, we've now had a whole series of TV debates where that have pitted these three candidates against each other. And it's already got quite lively. Take us through what the highlights have been. Well, it all fairly kicked off with the very first debate. It started with Kate Forbes making an opening statement that called the Scottish Government's record mediocre. More of the same is not a manifesto. It's an acceptance of mediocrity. Which was quite something from the serving finance secretary. She then went on to attack Hamza Youssef's competence in office. There's a big backlash to that. Hamza Youssef has said she would pull the SNP to the right. If a change means lurching to the right, Kate, 
If it means rolling back now, our progressive values, I don't think that's good. If you think lurching to the right is job creation, how are you going to generate the growing economy? And has constantly painted himself as the progressive candidate and a barely veiled attack on Kate Forbes's social views. Could you serve, for example, a First Minister who did vote on these issues according to religious faith? I am unashamedly progressive, and we have done well with our progressive agenda in the SNP. If I was to be asked to be in a government, uh, I would have to uh, be comfortable that the progressive agenda that has won us so much support in this country, that that was something that so the next First not. Minister was going to continue. So there's not been a lot of holding back from the candidates. And in terms of those debates, you know, you've already got these two candidates tearing strips off each other. And for a lot of people, it would have been the first time they've really seen Ash Regan in a proper um, leadership context, you know, debating the big issues. How has she come across? Hmm. Ash Regan has had a slightly difficult time, I think it's fair to say, on the televised debates. She doesn't have the same experience as Kate Forbes or Hamza Youssef, and that that has shown. She was eviscerated by Beth Rigby when asked about the institutions that would be needed to set up a Scottish currency in the event of independence. So you need a central bank? What about the other institutions you need? What other institutions are you talking about? You don't know. The Independent Debt Management Office. Right, I'm sure, as I said, I don't have the full detail on this at the moment. And there have been other difficult moments for her, including um, talking, this was in a hustings rather than a televised debate, but talking about an independence readiness thermometer, which would be erected somewhere and would show if Scotland was getting closer to independence to reassure the public. What's one of those? I'm not entirely sure. The best I can tell is that it would basically light up as different uh, policy ambitions were met or different questions were answered until you had, uh, you know, a, a nice, big, bright, shiny thermometer or sign or something of that ilk that would say we're ready for independence. And in terms of this leadership election and those debates, you know, apart from attacking each other's records, have they also told us where they stand on the thorny issue of, of independence? Because, you know, as you said, Nicola Sturgeon, part of her undoing was her independence strategy. You know, she wanted the next election as a de facto referendum on independence. Do any of these candidates want that? And how, how fast do they want independence to happen? Well, there's a slight irony in Ash Regan's position, given that she is in some ways the most anti-establishment, most anti-Sturgeon candidate, but has a view on independence that is closest to Nicola Sturgeon's uh, de facto referendum plan. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She has said that any election should be used as effectively a de facto referendum, whether it's a UK general election, whether it is a Holyrood election. And by contrast, both Hamza Youssef and Kate Forbes have taken a pretty big step back from that. They've said that independence should be at the centre of any election campaigning, but have really moved away from that de facto idea. And in fact, both of them, despite saying, as Ash Reagan did during televised debates, that they believe independence could be achieved within the next five years, the noises they are making is about building support for independence until it gets to a stage that the UK government can't ignore it anymore and agrees to a referendum that would almost be confirmatory. And if that is their strategy, then that is a much more long-term strategy than the idea that Scotland will be independent in five years. And Kieran, over the weekend, it wasn't the leadership contest but the party itself that seemed to be making headlines. We had a whole series of very high-profile resignations. They were sort of falling like dominoes. And some of that is actually related to this leadership contest and to the people who actually get to vote in it. Just take us back to the beginning and explain what on earth has been going on. Yeah, so from the beginning of the campaign, there have been complaints from some of the candidates about secrecy around how the election has been run. One of those big complaints was that the candidates, the public, the party membership didn't actually even know 
how many members were entitled to vote. There were rumours, in fact, there were reports in the Sunday Mail newspaper that numbers had fallen significantly. The Sunday Mail said that there were 30,000 members had left, which is an important number to come back to. But the SNP press office denied this. They stuck steadfast to Hmm. the idea that there was still around 100,000 members in the party. That was the amount that had been in place at the end of 2021, the last time the numbers had been made public. Then, of course, the pressure continues on SNP headquarters. They eventually release the numbers at the tail end of last week. And it turns out that the membership had indeed dropped by a little more than 30,000 to 72,000 members. This set off a, a chain reaction unlike anything I've really seen in Scottish politics. It was fury over the fact that the party had lied, not only to the media, but also to the public, and ultimately to its own membership and supporters. Murray Foote, who uh, a well-respected former journalist, he was the editor-in-chief of the Daily Record and indeed the Sunday Mail who broke that story, had moved to be the SNP's head of communications at the Scottish Parliament. He quit on Friday night and suggested heavily that he had been misled with those figures. And that and that intensified pressure on Peter Murrell, who's the chief executive of the SNP and Nicola Sturgeon's husband. It became clear throughout Friday that Peter Murrell could not survive. And on Saturday, he resigned as chief executive of the SNP. And Michael Russell, who actually was chief executive way back before Peter Murrell took over in 1999, as the current party president, has stepped back into his own job and is trying desperately to steady the ship as we go through the final days of this leadership campaign. And so, Kieran, that's clearly sort of around the secrecy around the membership figures. Also, some of the secrecy just around the leadership contest altogether. I mean, in the last few days, just before those resignations, we did have Ash Regan saying having Peter Morrill running this election campaign was a bit like having Carrie choosing who would be Boris's successor. Yeah, so on the on the Ash Regan claims and Peter Morrill running the election, the SNP has stressed on multiple occasions that Peter Morrill actually doesn't run the election despite being chief executive, that it is the party's elected national secretary, Lorna Finn, who oversees that process. There were concerns about SNP headquarters being able to get running totals of who had voted and and voting turnout and you know who was um, getting the most votes amongst members. That has all been denied by SNP headquarters. But of course, the problem is now we know they lie about membership figures. You've got to take everything with a pretty large pinch of salt. I mean, how much of an impact will those resignations and the scandal around them have on the party, regardless of who ends up leading it? Well, that's going to be one of the really significant challenges. The SNP has muscle memory in it for winning elections. It's been an incredible machine over the last few years. And now we're seeing there's a you know there's a bit of momentum for Labour once again Scotland for the first time, certainly in the decade or slightly more that I've been covering Scottish politics, for the first time Labour look like they're advancing a little bit and seem genuinely happy at the same time that the SNP is losing that muscle memory. So the next leader is going to face a big, big challenge, particularly at the next general election. And then after that, you know, looking forward to 2026, when we have the next Scottish Parliament election to decide who will be the government of Scotland. And do we know, as things stand, which of these candidates the public are backing? You know, I know they don't get a vote in the leadership contest, but who would the public want as their next first minister? Has there been some polling done? There has been a reasonable amount of polling done and what it shows is that none of the candidates are really commanding overwhelming confidence, but that Kate Forbes is the most favoured within the public at large. Also, is generally the most popular amongst SNP voters. Our exclusive poll shows Kate Forbes, whose campaign many thought had imploded last month, is now leading amongst the general public and among SNP voters is neck and neck with the self-styled continuity candidate, Hamza Youssef. 
Now, of course, the public at large and even SNP voters are not necessarily SNP members. So we don't know if that means mm. that Kate Forbes is, is popular amongst the activists and wider membership of the SNP, but certainly from the, all the polling that's been done so far, she appears to be best placed to win over the general public. And in terms of this leadership contest, how easy is that to predict? Would you be able to lay a bet now on who would win? Oh, absolutely not. There's only one poll done of SNP members and it showed that Hamza Youssef was a smidge ahead of Kate Forbes, but that actually the largest proportion of SNP members that it surveyed still hadn't made up their mind. So there, there's a lot to play for. Wow. Even even very senior people in the SNP say it's very difficult to predict where the membership will fall. When there was a Tory leadership contest in, in England recently, there was a huge split between where the membership were and where members of parliament were. Is it similar in Scotland? I mean, where would the MSPs vote if they could? Yeah, the, the MSPs have overwhelmingly backed Hamza Youssef. If this was down to parliamentarians, Hamza Youssef would absolutely scoosh it. So that's where it will be very interesting to see if the membership lines up with the parliamentarians or whether it goes somewhere different entirely. And ironically, that would mean that the membership would be, according to the most recent polls at least, broadly more in line with the general public's view than the parliamentarians are. What is the voting system that will be used? It's a single transferable vote. So members were asked to rank their candidates in order of preference, which means you can cast up to three votes. You know, for example, cast Hamza Youssef first preference, Kate Forbes second, Ash Regan third, or any combination of those. If no candidate achieves more than 50% on the first round of voting, the candidate with the lowest number of votes is knocked out, and any second preferences cast for them would move on to another candidate. So why that might be important is there's an expectation that the vast majority of Ash Regan's votes will give their second preference to Kate Forbes. And that means that if Hamza Yusuf does not win with more than 50% of the vote at the first pass, then it could well be that Kate Forbes comes through on the second round, picks up the transfers from Ash Regan and ends up winning the contest overall. Wow, so Ash Regan's supporters basically end up becoming the kingmakers. Yes, absolutely. You know, for all Ash Regan has been ridiculed by some people during this campaign, both her candidacy and her supporters could prove absolutely crucial to who becomes next First Minister. It sounds like whoever wins will have a lot of challenges coming in and trying to reunite the party. They're also going to have the disadvantage of not being Nicola Sturgeon. You know, whatever you thought of her, she was quite clearly a huge, a huge figure in Scottish politics. What do you think the SNP's electoral chances are at the next election, given they're going to have a new leader? A big challenge for the SNP at the next election is just the fact the next election is a UK-wide general election with Labour currently riding high and looking like a genuine prospect of being the next UK government. We ran, or rather I sat in on, a number of really interesting focus groups that were carried out by More in Common, the campaign group and think tank, of SNP voters in some key Labour target seats. And there was a couple of really interesting things that came out of that. One of them was that of the nine people there, I think four of them said that they planned to vote Labour at the next general election to get the Tories out, was their words and their view, and only one of them said that they would definitely vote SNP. So whoever the next leader is, is going to need to reach out in a way that Nicola Sturgeon was able to, but none of the three candidates so far have shown that they'll be anywhere near that level of universal or kind of beyond your target core vote reach and I expect the SNP will lose seats even though they will almost certainly be the largest party but they will almost certainly lose seats and that will pile more pressure on whoever is leader.
You've been listening to Stories of Our Times, a podcast brought to you thanks to the subscribers of The Times and The Sunday Times, with me, Manveen Rana, and my guest, the Scottish political editor for The Times and The Sunday Times, Kieran Andrews. If you'd like to find out more about the candidates who are standing, you can listen to them all tonight as part of the Times Radio SNP debate at 8pm. You'll want to have a listen. The producers today were James Shield and Priyanka Deladia. The executive producer is Kate Ford and sound design was by David Crackles. Tomorrow, continuing our coverage of the 20th anniversary of the Iraq War, we'll hear from Catherine Philp, who's returned to Baghdad to see how Iraq has been scarred by war and what hope there is for its future. Do have a listen. <laughs>